Today we have Richard Poole with us, and he is Professor Emeritus of Theater and Speech Communications at Briarcliff <laughs> University. He is an author, an actor, a director, and a playwright, and he is bringing you all this knowledge to talk about the history of theater in the Midwest. So, please welcome Richard Poole. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you for being here on, on a uh, misty, rainy day. It was raining in Sioux City when I came up, and then when I got to Hartley, it stopped, and then about five minutes outside of Hartley, it started again. So what can you do? Today I'm going to talk about a number of things, uh, and then after, when I'm done, if you have questions, be sure and ask. I'm going to talk about certain theater venues, particularly for small towns, and rural communities, such as opera houses, air domes, circle stock, and tent rep, most of which you probably either have not heard of or have not experienced. So where does theater influence come from? The British, primarily. The British were, had opera houses back in the 17th century, uh, and what they did was they performed light operas, primarily Italian operas, opera bouffe, things that were very kind of just fun to do. When you get to the colonies, remember that there are really three sections of colonies. There's the New England colonies, and then there's the middle, Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania, and there's the middle colonies, and then there are the southern colonies. The southern colonies were the most simpatico to theater because, as you may remember, New Orleans was uh, controlled at one point by the Spanish, controlled by the French, and they really believed in theater. The New England colonies, however, uh, did not think very highly of theater, and even though they didn't, there were traveling troops that came in from places like Jamaica and would perform in Rhode Island. Now, it was illegal to put on plays, so what did they do? Well, you rank in a wonderful book that you may or may not have called Theater in America. He tells us this, the King's Arms Tavern, Newport, Rhode Island. On Monday, June 10th, at the public room of the above inn, will be delivered a series of moral dialogues in five parts, depicting the evil effects of jealousy and other bad passions, and proving that happiness can only spring from the pursuit of virtue. Mr. Douglas, who ran the company, will represent a noble and magnanimous moor named Othello who loves a lady named Desdemona, and after he has married her, harbors, as in too many cases, the dreadful passion of jealousy. Of jealousy, our being's bane, mark the small cause and the most dreadful pain. And then it goes on to talk about some of the other characters and what's going to happen. Finally, at the very end, it says, Mr. Douglas will be her faithful attendant, who will hold out a good example to all servants, male and female, and to all people in subjugation. Obedience and gratitude are things as rare as they are good. Uh, various other dialogues, too numerous to mention here, will be <coughs> delivered at night as well as adapted to the minds and manners. The whole will be repeated on Wednesday and Saturday, tickets six shillings each to be had within commencement at seven, conclusion, at half past ten, in order that every spectator may go home at a sober hour and reflect upon what he has seen before he retires to rest. And of course, what they're doing is they're presenting William Shakespeare's Othello, and they're trying to gussy it up in the guise of moral dialogues. During the Revolutionary War, you may recall, that the Continental Congress said that there would be no shows, no plays, nothing at all. And of course, the British loved plays. And when they were billeted in places like Philadelphia, New York, Boston, particularly the officers, they put on plays. And of course, I'm sure it really irritated uh, the colonists no end. So where do we get opera house from, besides having some connection with Britain? In the United States, in 1787, the Southwark Theater in Philadelphia was renamed the Southwark Opera House. Why? Because a theater was a place you don't want young ladies of quality going to. It had it was kind of déclassé. It didn't have any cachet of class. It was where low, low people went. So you called it an opera house. 
That had a feeling of elegance and a cachet of class. When we talk about the Civil War, <coughs> there are a number of things that happen. Some of them good, and some of them not so good, as well you know. I mean, half a million people were killed, rifle barreling came in, uh, slavery was outlawed, at least that's what they said. But something that people almost never talk about, almost never talk about, is how transportation was affected. Now, depending on what source you read, before the Civil War, there were anywhere from 2,000 to 8,000 miles of track in the United States. And I'm not talking about Promontory Port in Utah, where the Golden Spike was laid. That didn't happen until 1869. But this is before the Civil War. And there were various gauges, various widths. So you really had to make sure that your train got on the right track, so to speak. <coughs> After the Civil War, and again, it depends on the sources that you look at, anywhere from 140,000 miles to 250,000 miles of track were laid by the turn of the century. And what did that mean? That meant you could get to anywhere from anywhere. And what that allowed traveling players to be able to get to various venues. Not only did they play in <coughs> opera houses, but they played in other particular organizational spaces like fraternities and sororities. Other things happened at opera houses between 1870 and 1915. High school graduation, because high schools had not built auditoria by that time. And also they would have religious ceremonies, and in some places, particularly in smaller towns, they had not built gymnasia. And so what you did is you played basketball in the opera house, and you had to dance around, they did, and you have to dance around the big, uh, uh, stoves that they would have at either end of the particular opera house. There were about a thousand opera houses in Iowa between 1860 and uh, uh, 1920 or so. Now they were also called other things. Town halls, community halls, academies of music. It has that ring to it. It's a high class place. It's an academy, or just plain the largest space in town. In many places, it was the largest community space that there was, and so many of activities took place. Now, when I talk about opera houses in the Midwest, which is where my focus is, and then the tighter focus is on Iowa, we're talking about these particular states, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, of course, and the western farming edges of Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Virtually every village, town, and city boasted at least one opera house. Now, regardless of what the town was, there was a certain structure to every one of them. They were either built out of brick or out of frame. They were either one story, two story, <coughs> or three story. What we can call them when we try to classify them are community halls or utility halls. That was where, this could be a utility hall. You've got the chairs, you haven't set up a stage here, but you could do that, and that would be a utility hall. And then you had places called opera halls. They were specifically designed to have theatrical performances, but they also had movable chairs that could go up. And then there were opera houses. These were built just specifically for the performance of amusements. And then, as they did have in Spencer before the fire, the Grand Opera House. And that, of course, is all gone. So these are the ones that people will look at. Now, what other places had performance facilities? Well, what we might call ethnic theater. Anybody whose background is German, Spanish, French, Irish, Swedish. Do you remember those Ole and Lena jokes? Oh yeah, there of course, right? Um, from Minnesota uh, primarily, and that's just for you. But the theatrical organizations in these towns had them. So you're dealing with, for example, uh, Germania Vereins, because they were athletic, but they also <coughs> had other cultural things going on. 
The Denmark's Minda, the CZBJ, and CSPS, both Czech societies. All of these places, including the Elks, the Modern Woodman, uh, the BPOE, the Modern IOOF, all of these played an important part in the development of small towns and venues where particular entertainments occurred. Now, hundreds of troops crossed and crisscrossed the Midwest from 1870 to 1915. Many were, were Iowa-based, and the one I want to talk a little bit about today was the George D. Sweet Players out of Storm Lake, Iowa, and they were called Sweet Shows because they were so clean. Supposedly, Sweet uh, spent his earliest years around early Iowa. He was reared in Storm Lake, left town to marry an actress, probably worked in small town opera houses and tent repertory companies. Uh, Sweet and his wife, a singer called Marjorie, and an actress played one night stands in opera houses before he founded the Sweet Players. Now, throughout their existence, these are some of the towns that the Sweet Players played in. Uh, and these are the kind of Broadway hits that they played. Deep Purple, A.B.'s Irish Rose, and a Schaffner player. Did anybody uh, remember the Schaffner <coughs> players? They were Toby and Susie shows. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. Up in uh, a slightly, uh, a slightly risque uh, called Up in Mabel's Room. And of course, nothing really went on what you would see on television nowadays. Uh, this, these were still pretty clean shows. Now here's where the sweet shows performed. Ruthven, Newell, Fonda, Pocahontas, Lorenz, Hartley, Sutherland, Spencer, of course, Emmitsburg, Storm Lake, Sac City, Shaler, Moville, Denison, Correctionville, Holstein, Lamars, Cherokee, Lytton, and to add an international flavor to their route, they also played up in Vermilion, uh, South Dakota. <laughs> Now, G.D., as he was called, was a performer himself. Uh, much of his acclaim went really to his wife and daughter. Mrs. Guy Mills of Sioux Rapids saw a sweet show at the Rossi Opera House in 1916 or 1917. She remembered that when Mrs. Sweet stepped out on the stage, the audience leaped to their feet and gave her such a warm welcome because besides being an actress, she was a very warm and gracious person. She would blow kisses to the crowd. Her daughter, Marjorie, was very much loved, too. Oftentimes, the local people would decorate their stage with bouquets of lilacs or wild plum blossoms or other flowers in season. So it was really, really a spectacular event. Now, what these players did, both in opera houses and in tent rep and in circle stock, and maybe even in air domes too, what they did was they did what was called doubling in brass. What that meant was they were in the orchestra. They were in the band. And many times what would happen is when they'd come into the town, the band would parade down the street. Now, circuses used to do that too, but I think circuses are pretty well gone. As you probably know, Barnum and Bailey ceased operations. And there may be a few circuses going around now, but not that many. And so they would double in brass. Not only did they double in brass, but they also built the sets. They also helped set up, for example, in tent repertory company. They also set up the tent. And what they would also do in tents and in opera houses is during the intermission, they would perform what are called specialties. Singing, dancing, tumbling, <coughs> playing the piano. They would do a lot of vaudeville acts. And also there was something called the candy pitch. What would happen is that the, the stage, no matter where the stage was, various uh, uh, things that you could win, various prizes were set up on the stage, and then you bought a box of candy, uh, let's say for 25 cents. In the box was a number, and if your number came up, you got to get the doll, the china, the whatever it happened to be, and that was an incentive for many times for people to come. Now, these are the kind of plays, and I'm sure that some of you may have heard of them, and if you haven't, they're kind of fun to talk about anyway, that were performed, beside the ones that I've mentioned. Mutt and Jeff in Panama, Sis Hopkins, Barriers Burned Away, Peck's Bad Boy, Cy Perkins, Lena Rivers, Quincy Adams Sawyer, The Old Homestead, The Lost Heir of Linen Throw, A Bunch of Keys, Tony the Convict, 
etc., etc. Opera houses were very, very important to the population. And what would happen when, again, the uh, people came on the stage, they were applauded, and people looked forward to this. You've got to remember, this was at a time when there were no <coughs> mechanical contrivances, although I'm using one at the very end of my presentation to show you uh, images of opera houses, air domes, uh, and tent repertory. You have to connect with people. That's one of the things that happens nowadays, particularly for the younger people. It's this, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But I like newspapers. I don't text my sons. I know Marsha, my wife, will say, why don't you text them? I don't know. I want to hear the sound of their voices. I want to, that tells me that they're really there. And that makes me feel a lot better. So there was no TV, no radio, no planes. Electricity had only been in about 30 years. Uh, virtually no movies, no movies at all until the beginning of the 20th century. So this was the significant part of entertainment. Not only did they do shows, but they also did something called the medicine show. I myself do a medicine show. The great Dr. Balthazar Tiarchavides and his wonderful elixir. And of course, you can see that, as I said uh, earlier in my conversation with one of you good folks here, on TV, I, you know, I've reached an age where I get up early in the morning, and blah, 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 bing, and then I'll watch a little TV. And there always are ads. This will help you. That will help you. This is, and the thing I love is when it says, all natural. All natural ingredients. And I'm always tempted to say, I want the unnatural ingredients. What does that really mean? Well, it's an attempt to get you to <coughs> buy the particular product. And my philosophy always has been, does it work? Keep it. If it doesn't work, dump it. And it seems very simple. But the medicine show was something that was really, really very popular. Now, Dorothy Mills tells us this about her experience at the Rossi Opera House. These were the days before we had many cars, and rather than miss a performance, local people would walk or drive a team of horses not to miss one. In winter, they would have to dress warmly, and overcoats were hung on nails at the back of the hall. When they would no longer hold them all, they would pile them up on the floor. After the show, what a scramble there would be to find the right overshoes, hats, and coats. When some of the larger companies came through, some of the ladies attending would dress in the height of fashion and tried hard to make good <coughs> impression in front of these famous entertainers, even though they might have just been run-of-the-mill country folks. Romantically inclined young couples would seek the darker parts of the opera house so that the boy could casually slip his arm around the girlfriend during some of the tender scenes of the play. Generally, the girl had her mind on the dashing young hero of the play and not of the person who had paid 10 cents, 20 cents, or 30 cents uh, to take her there. In between the acts, the comedians took over, and some would tell jokes and, uh, at the expense of a local resident. And what would happen, and you'll see this when we get to the uh, images, there were what are called <coughs> drop curtains. And what would happen in these drop curtains is that you would buy an ad. Robin's Library Apparel, let's say. Certain things that you have to wear. <laughs> or TCU's Best Graduate. And that would be on there. And so when the audience would come in, they would see this up on the stage. No matter what the play, serious drama, mystery, or a comedy, people were not ashamed to express their feelings by shedding a tear, laughing loudly, clapping their hands, or cheering when the patriotic scenes took place. They enjoyed and were carried away by the talents of these actors and actresses. The little curtain speeches always brought applause. The musicals brought the best of music and talented dancing girls as grateful and light on their feet, <coughs> performing many kinds of dancing. Their dresses were all beautiful, all properly designed, and their picture hats or beflowered and ribboned hats would delight any maiden. The men wore straw hats, carried canes, and could do many fancy steps, leaving the echo of dancing feet always in your memory. 
Finally, Mrs. Edwin Seabury of Pisgah recalls her opera house days and the wonder and excitement she felt performing there. Then there was the stage. I still see it in my mind's eye, as clear as the first day I appeared on it. Brightly painted scenery with local advertising, a roller front curtain, back and side scenery, enough to delight the eye of one who was immersed in dramatic theater as I was. My father's cousin, Mabel <coughs> Eaton, was a Shakespearean actress in New York City and Chicago. She was married to William Farnham, who later became a silent, still uh, 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 actor, silent film actor. I had photographs of her in different costumes which enthralled me. And so the opera houses, the tent rep, the air dome, the circle stock, enthralled many people because they were able to see the dramatic performances come alive, to connect with the people. Now, sometimes you look out at an audience, and this has happened to me, sad to say, they all look like they just had a shot of Novik. <coughs> and I'm going, oh my goodness, I've got to get louder or softer or do something in order to get and keep their attention within the compass of the play. But nonetheless, as I was speaking earlier, there's nothing like being out there as a performer connecting with the audience and knowing that they're right there, they're listening. You got them, even for a few minutes, and they enjoy the godly that has happened. So when we talk about opera houses, we're talking about different sizes and shapes, and you'll see that when we go uh, to the illustrations. When we talk about air domes, I remember when I did my research on air domes, I wrote to every historical uh, society in all the counties of Iowa. And half of them or more would write back and say, do you mean air drones? Do you mean uh, airplanes? What are you talking about? My guess is that some of the folks in here remember drive-in movies. Yeah, yeah? Okay, well, yeah. those are gone too, uh, mostly. But what an air dome was, was it was like a walk-in where there were theatrical performances. <laughs> it would happen in towns, particularly uh, small towns, where you'd have a vacant lot, and you'd have two buildings, and a theater was put in, high board fence, so people couldn't look over or get underneath. And I suppose they might have hung out the windows, like they do at some of the ball games when you watch ball games across from Comiskey Park or other places in Chicago. But the air domes were created because of one reason and one reason only. Money. Why money? Well, air conditioning didn't come into opera houses until the, the teens and it really wasn't that effective. So the opera houses were really hot in the summer. But people still had to work. So they took the whole business and took it outside. And also this al fresco -ness, which would which had started really at the end of the 19th century where you have things like amusement parks and the white city and outdoor facilities for eating and for playing. That was also a part of the attractiveness. In bigger cities, for example, like St. Louis, the air dome would be at the end of a bus line or a train line where people could go and do a whole day. They did the same kind of shows in the air domes and the opera houses in the tent rep and also in the circle stock. Circle stock, wagon wheel. Right? In the center of the wagon wheel is the hub. And what you did with circle stock is you stayed in one particular location to rehearse. Let's say it's Spencer. And then you went out to Sheldon and Hartley and Melvin. And what you would do is you would rehearse a show in Spencer during the day, and then in the evening you would go out and perform another show that you'd rehearsed at one of these venues. Then you'd come back and the whole <coughs> process would repeat itself. And that was very effective both in the Midwest, some in the South, some in the Northeast, uh, between about 1906 and 1921. There are about 496 of these air domes throughout the United States, and they were very effective. <coughs> and finally, Tank Rupp. Theater in a tent. A lot of things were in tents. Chautauqua, 
was intense. You've heard of Chautauqua, really started in the 19th century as a religious uh, uh, educational aspect of the Methodist Church at Lake Chautauqua up in uh, upper uh, New York State. And then eventually Chautauqua, they did plays in Chautauqua, they gave speeches, but that sometimes was an intent. Sometimes in some locations you'll find a permanent Chautauqua building. But Tent Rep did that. They would go from town to town to town to town, and they would play various kinds of plays, some of which I've mentioned before. And people looked for them and wanted to be connected with them year after year after year. Now, they traveled by horse and wagon, and then when the war, talking about World War I, came along, the railroad uh, commandeered all the uh, railroad cars that they would travel in after the horse and wagon days. And so they went in buses and in trucks. And the last, <laughs> there was a tent rep company in Tennessee. They still do some shows uh, now, but most of them were finished by the 1960s. So Opera House's Tent Rep, Circle Stock, and Air Dome. The Sweet Shows? Right. When, when did he operate out of Stormwind? 1915. <coughs> For just a brief period of time then? Yeah, yeah, 1950. Well, uh, you know, actually he was killed in the 20s uh, in uh, Louisiana. A logging truck mm -hmm. kind of fell on his car. But he used to, uh, G.D. Sweet used to uh, uh, go around town uh, with uh, this uh, uh, pearl gray hat, and he fancied big cigars, and he drove in a car called a Kissel, <laughs> which is kind of the Cadillac of its day, had a beautiful interior, it had uh, cut glass uh, uh, holders, uh, vases on the side, so you could put flowers <coughs> in. It was really a showman, and people said, I want to go see this stuff. And it really was, he really was an important showman. One of the things I want you to look at, folks, when the images come around, is that this will be primarily opera houses, and then we have air domes, and we have tent rep. Some of the images are uh, in other areas. In other words, uh, in the, in, you might get a, a, a tent rep one in the opera house section, but just that's the way it happened to be put together. Uh, and you can tell, look at one story. This would have been a utility hall. It might have been a community hall. Well, at Al Alborn, okay. And here's Anthony's, or Anthony's rather, Anthony's Opera House, second story. And ladies and gentlemen, if you will look at the top, that false front was pretty typical. You'll see a number of buildings uh, built between 1900 and 1920 where they had that. Next group. Armstrong Opera House, third story. And notice, if you will, please, on the outside, that's how you got to the Opera House. Next. Uh, this is in Avoca. Uh, my understanding is that it's all gone. Uh, Dr. Glenn and I are redoing our Opera House book, and one of the things we checked on was whether the structures were up or whether they were gone or not. Uh, and it was on the second story. Next, please. Ayrshire, second <coughs> story. Notice they're built of wood or of brick or of stone. The Battle Creek, the Luna Theater. It's a beautiful, beautiful facility. Later became a movie house, which is a number one of these things. Uh, a number of these opera houses were turned into movie houses. Or they fell prey to the wrecking ball, or they were built, uh, apartments were built within them. I remember when I was doing the research, I stopped at a place off of 80 called Casey. And I drove into town and I said, do you have any, well, we used to, well, do you have any uh, drops, flats, scenery, anything, uh, advertising? Well, we used to, we took them out today to the, to the dump, burned them all. I went, ah, because I belong to an organization called the National Association of Tent Rep and Folk Theater down in Mount Pleasant, uh, which is where the old Threshers are. And there's a wonderful theater museum there, which has all sorts of advertisements and paint sketches and costumes and programs. And every year they have a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful uh, conference there. The Blockton Opera House, second story. The Box Home Opera House. I see they put a sign up says the old opera house, okay. Brita, that had been on the second story. Go ahead. Bert, 
Carol, Carson, second story. And you can tell the different way they constructed things. The Coin Opera House. Uh, now, and this Corning Opera House is a, was a gorgeous facility. I think they, they're redoing it. Uh, but when I was taking pictures of the interior, it, uh, when I was there, they, it turned it into a, uh, a newspaper. But when I took pictures of the interior, I had to, uh, from the balcony, the balcony had big holes in it, a lot of the wood, so I had to kind of balance myself <laughs> between the two and take pictures so I wouldn't fall. But, and that's another thing that makes all of this really fun, because you get an opportunity not just to visit the musty old past, but places where people truly cared about each other and about what went on. Correction Bill, uh, uh, that was on the second story. That's gone now. It had been turned into a hotel apartment and the whole thing collapsed. Luckily, nobody, won, nobody was uh, injured. Cumberland, second story on the left. The Decatur City Opera House, you see that it has all the same kind of thing, second floor next. The Dedham, I mean, this must have been a pretty impressive place. I remember it was at the end of a road and, you know, people either knock it down for the land or they put something else in there. The Galva, the second Hoops Theater, right at the bottom. Diagonal Opera House, now a quick little story about the Diagonal Opera House. I would go around to these places and you'd have to talk to people, for example, either in the taverns or in the grocery stores or in the libraries or in the city halls. And I'd say, well, I understand there's an opera. Oh, yeah, there's an opera house here, okay. Uh, can I get to, yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, how do I get it? Where, well, second story. Well, where do I, well, I tell you, we, we, uh, there was a uh, stairway that fell apart. Uh, so what you have to do is get a ladder and go to the building next door and get on that ladder and get on that building's roof and then you walk across the roof and there's a window there and you'll be able to get in through the window. Now, of course, I was, you know, I was in my 30s then when none of that mattered, so I said, okay. I had my camera, I had my measuring tape, I had my notes, I was ready to rock and roll. So I started crossing over and I looked at the window, it was kind of gray. But then the gray started to move. It was a bunch of bees who were just kind of waking up and they were at the window and I said, well, they haven't awakened yet. You do dumb things when you're younger. So what I did is I threw open the window and jumped in. Now, I didn't know that there was gonna be a floor there. I could have gone down to the second story. But fortunately, there was a floor, and I, there was a very small stage, 18 feet wide by 12 feet deep. Very small. But it was there. The Loeb Theater in Galva, now the American Legion Hall. <coughs> Garden Grove, the Dill Sailor. Dill Sailor, go ahead. Gilmore City. Grand Opera House, and there's another image of the Grand, Opera, Grand River Opera House. Second story, the Greenville Opera House, Harlan. The Harlan Opera House, we were, uh, I took a bunch of students, I used to teach a course called History of Theater in Western Iowa. I didn't take it for one, one credit. So we travel around to various places and I would try to get a hold of people who own these places and say, can we go in, can we measure, can we take pictures? Because I wanted my students to be aware of the fact that there was an entire life beyond the mechanical where people really did these things. Okay, so we're at the Harlan Opera House and we happened to go around the back and I saw this drop. A drop is painted canvas which can have scenes on it, it also can have advertisements on it and you'll see some of that when, when they come up here. And it was in the snow and all I had were a carry-all, you know, I had a, a nail puller and a hammer and I said, guys, let's, and I went to the owner, I said, do you mind if we take this with us? And she said, no, I'll go ahead. So we got it out of the snow, we put it in the truck, took it home, and I took it down to the museum in Mount Pleasant where it's hanging now, and it's the only example of a drop built by a company in Minneapolis called the Joy & Coates Scenic Company. It's the only one that I've ever seen. 
Now, there are other scenic companies that build drops and flats and paints and all sorts of scenery. And they were <coughs> Twin City Scenic, which is up in Minneapolis, Kansas City Scenic, Omaha Scenic, and a place called Sossman and Landis in Chicago. Hospers, second story. I had to with the Princess Theater, and you can see where it was turned into a movie house. And there's another, it's on the left. Now, Jamaica. Anybody know where Jamaica is? Not down in the south, but. And look at the detail. This is press tin. Mm -hmm. Really nice stuff, okay? There it is, second story. Uh, the modern Woodman Hall, that would have been on the second story again. Okay. Lake City Opera House, third story. Uh, Lake Park, and remember that frontispiece we talked about, the kind of very typical architecture. Okay. Lake View Opera House. Lennox, second story. Lewis, and they were tearing that down just when I got there. So I said, can I do it? No, I'm sure, boy, take pictures. And that's what I did, okay? The Little Sioux Opera House, Carrie's <coughs> Opera House and Little Sioux, which is kind of around my territory off of 29. This is the Logan Opera House. And a couple things I want you to be aware of. Number one, see those men in there? They're all wearing ties and coats. These are all farmers. This is the Iowa State Extension Service corn facility. They're, doing, they're, they're giving all sorts of instructions on how to plant the best seeds. And if you look up at top, you see that's where the balcony was. You see the chairs are up there? And now another shot. And there it is from the balcony. And what you can see is you can see up here what's called the proscenium arch. See where that is? That comes out of uh, Renaissance Italy in the 16th <coughs> century. Proscenium really means picture frame. And when they started doing perspective, in scenic design, it was just a revolution. It wasn't all flat. It was had depth to it. And so they had these, and you can see where things are off stage. And you can see, if you see right up here, you see where they, they look like tooths, but they really are corn, corn pieces on how to go ahead and plant the best. And the thing that really astounds me a little bit is the fact that all of these men, not just that they're farmers wearing ties and coats, but they're men wearing ties and coats. And if you ever see any, um, pictures, or if you remember, I was born in the early 40s, so I can remember going to ball games in Detroit when I was a kid, and men wear coats and ties, people got dressed up, they got dressed up to go to the movies. And one other thing that has nothing to do with it, but it has to do with the change of time, when you went on a date, at least when I did, you take, took your, the girl to dinner and a show, and I don't mean McDonald's either. <laughs> Nowadays, it's... <coughs> Change is the one thing that we have as a constant. Okay, go ahead. Erin Canyon, okay. Lauraville, Opera House Interior, play. Go ahead. And there's another shot of the interior. There they say, go ahead. Macedonia. Some of these buildings are really elegant. Madrid, Woodman Opera House on the red. Morris. You don't call it Maurice. You can always tell if you're not from Iowa if you call it Maurice. It's Morris. Okay. Merrill, which is on the way up here out of uh, 75. One of my students, if you ever watch, Chan do you get Channel 4 up here from Sioux City? Yeah. All right. Years ago, did you ever watch the weather? And there was a red-haired kid called Mike Wonkum. Okay, he was one of my students. And he married my sister-in-law. And I introduced him. Now he's in Boston and he's a, a big deal at uh, ABC station. <laughs> wonderful guy. <coughs> Small town guy, wonderful guy. Okay, another shot of the Merrill Opera House, big festival, a lot of Navy guys as you see. Monita. Go ahead. And here is a drop curtain, it's an advertising curtain. Now, what you'll notice, it's from Nimaha. Anybody know where Nimaha is? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, what, and I think it's in the bank now. A lot of these places had uh, these advertising curtains. So the first thing you did when you walked in, you saw, you know, here are all the advertisements. Uh, now, sometimes in, 
and, and with this one, it looks like there was an itinerant painter. His perspective is really off. Many times what you would get is you would get these center panels painted by people, and they would have all sorts of uh, flora that didn't go with each other. They'd have mountains, uh, and instead of having hardwood, they'd have pine trees, or, uh, or palm trees, rather. And so you're going, wow. But see, this is where you could go and get stuff, OK? And there's the uh, Hartley Opera House, O'Brien County, and there's the outside stairs. Some of the buildings are just gorgeous. And the Sutherland Opera House. I've been in that, and what they did was, I don't know if it's still there or not, one of my students was from Sutherland, and so we went there with her, and it was, it was turned into a movie house, and with many small towns, you don't have a lot of people who can run the movies, so the townspeople take turns. They run the movies, and they do the concessions, and as you probably know, you don't make your money on the movie. The movie costs a lot to rent. You make your money on the treats. And this is plan of an old opera house, ballroom, seating, lunchroom, ticket office. Okay. Ogden. Some of the ones, some of the, uh, the images that are really faded are ones that I can only get from a newspaper. Okay. Anoa. Interior. And what you can see here, excuse me, is uh, you can see these, these flats that would come in. They would be framed and they would be uh, wood flats that would come in from the sides. You have one, two, three. And sometimes in the old uh, uh, play texts, it would say in one, in two, in three, or R1, R2, R5. <coughs> and on the right side, the space between a piece of scenery and was going straight upstage or away from the audience, okay? IOOF Hall, Perry, Pilot Mound, Pisca, now the American Legion Post, right? And this is the cells. Now, one thing, let's say Robin wanted to uh, have an opera house. And so she would call it, because I forgot your last name. <laughs> and she would have the Robin Opera House, right? And it was a block, but it's not a block as we think of a block in terms of uh, <coughs> going from 2nd to 3rd to 4th Street. It was the building. And in the building, particularly in the larger structures, you would have the opera house on the second or third floor, and then on the lower floors you would have apartments, you would have the post office, you would have uh, a candy shop in order to pay for what happened. What would happen is people would get a hold of Robin, and they said the people who were who were uh, sending out these troops, and they say, who do you want to come? Or what kind of place do you have? Uh, does it have electricity? Is it lit by gas? How many seats? Where are the newspapers? Is there a doctor? How many sets of scenery do you have? And she would provide all that information, and then the traveling troop coming in would make whatever adjustments that they needed to. And here's a longer shot of that. In the late 90s, it was seats. Reading Opera House, and you see the outside there. Some of these I couldn't get into. Rems and Jack Teal Tire Company uh, was on the second floor. They were very gracious. And there were a lot of uh, flats and drops that we took from there down to the museum in Mount Pleasant. Renbrook Opera House, it was Jerry's Cafe, okay. Ringstead, another Ringstead. The Wolf Opera House in Ruthven. The Royal Opera House with awning. Go ahead. Salix, which is around my territory, second story. Okay. Now, this is a diagram of the P.D. Grant Opera House in Sioux City. It was a gorgeous theater built by a very famous uh, Chicago theater architect called Oscar Cobb. And this is a diagram of the ground floor. What I want you to notice particularly is up here, where these boxes are. These boxes were called nacelle boxes, and in French that means hanging baskets. And he was the one, supposedly, who developed that kind of innovation within the opera house. Now, here's the second story. You see where the nacelle boxes are? A, B, C, D, E, right? Okay, next. Now, this is a side shot. There are those hanging baskets at the top. Notice also, if you will, please, ladies, up there on the left-hand side of the screen is the gallery. That had backless benches. That also had an outside entrance, so we don't want to mix with the riffraff. So people who were poor, minorities, 
they, there was the cheapest seats were up there, as the French would say, les enfants du paradis, the gallery gods. It didn't cost very much. And then the second was the balcony, and the most expensive was on the ground floor. And if you see here on the right side, right up here, this was a, a light uh, that was powered by gas. <coughs> Originally, gas was a gas table, just like an electrical table. But remember, electricity didn't come into about 1879, 1880. And even then, a lot of places were not set up for electricity. So you had in many, many theaters gas and electric. And here we had uh, a drugstore. Next. And here's a shot from the back of the house. And you see, and uh, you can just see, these are called proscenium doors. So you could come in, and here was the apron here. There is the proscenium arch, and they have the flat set up for what pr pretty much looks like an interior shot. Could have been a d domestic drama of some kind. Program. Years and years and years ago, ideas simplified and encapsulated with our own formulas a lot of these programs, because otherwise, they would fall apart. Now, you know that after 1840 or 1850, people didn't uh, make books and newspapers. Uh, they were not rag papers. They weren't made out of linen or cotton. They were made out of pulp. And pulp with the <coughs> inks that went on them would help to disintegrate stuff. I don't know if you folks have ever been to the Library of Congress and, Washington, D.C. It's a wonderful place. Uh, but about a third of the collection you can take, and I didn't do this, believe me, uh, but you can take a, who else says believe me? Uh, no. uh, I take a corner, you could take a little corner of a page and go like this, and it's gone because all that stuff is starting to deteriorate. Okay. Now, here, as we know, is a drop, and you can see it's the meeting of Caesar and Cleopatra at the Sidnaus River. Everybody remembers that, of course. And there's the proscenium arch, and there's the drop curtain. And here's the kind of sodas and uh, 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 different uh, claret punch, crushed strawberry you could get at the little store there. Go ahead. In the view. Now, this is a wonderful shot. This is from the back of the stage. And what you can see right, right at the very top, of course, is the gallery, and then there's the balcony, and then there's the ground floor. Now, in order to get to the balcony, you, you had to get to the balcony from the outside. But you could also reach it from the inside. You could open one of the doors that were in the, in the balcony. But the door did not open from the gallery into the balcony. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why they did that. We don't want those people mixing with the people of quality. Okay. Now, this is what the P.D. Grand looked like. Gorgeous facility, 1,300 seats, mansard room. Uh, as we see right here, that's a bust of Bill Shakespeare, and then the three muses are here. And if you look on the side, it wasn't a, a stairway, but it was a door right there where you went up to the, the gallery. Sioux Rapids, who's from, there you go. <laughs> now is the museum, right? There it is, second story. 1894. 1894, that's right, next. Smithland Opera House, next. <coughs> now, both of these opera houses have burned down. The first image, I didn't, that had burned down before I got there. This one I was in, but then it has also burned down. And we're almost done, so hang in there with me. I appreciate your patience. Templeton Opera House on the second story. Okay, and here's the Tingley Opera House with the orchestra and a drop curtain in back. Tingley Opera House on the top story. Go ahead. Trainer. Truro. Again, second story, second story. Go ahead. Wall Lake, second story. Walnut. I think the Walnut Opera House has been remodeled. That's on 80. That's off of 80. Go ahead. All right. Whittemore. Second story. All right, now we're going to go to just a few more images, and they will be primarily of air domes and tent wrap. Okay, that's just air dome theater in Ellsworth. Okay, go ahead. And this is one in Kansas. I can't remember exactly where. Again, look at the seats. Go ahead. And this is a tent wrap stage. Notice the chairs, the people on the stage. Next. And this is they're setting up the tent, just like a circus tent. Next. 
and see, oh, uh oh, there must have been something slightly salacious that somebody heard on this. Maybe it was up in Mabel's room. Okay, next. And there the other people are on the stage in the tent again, next. And they're lining up to go to the theater at the tent, next. And this is the opera house at Perry. This is the opera house in Fayette, Missouri. And you look at the seats on the side, right? And the, and the drop curtain, go ahead. Garden uh, Theater. The finest air dome, Shenandoah, Iowa, had an air dome. You can see where it had the advertisements next and the chairs. And the air dome in Long Branch, New Jersey, next. And this is the Orpheum Theater in Sioux City. There are three Orpheums, in, or rather in Omaha. There are three Orpheums in Sioux City. I think ours is better than this one. The last one, it was remodeled in 2001. It is a gorgeous facility. If you ever get a chance, it's, it's the leading character in its own play. It is really a beautiful <coughs> play. Opera House in York, Nebraska, will write soon. Go ahead. Air Dome Theater in Danville, next. Air Dome Theater in Fort Wayne, next. All right, now these last ones should be of uh, uh, 10 reps. Go ahead. <laughs> Obviously, they've seen something that has tickled them. And uh, the thing is, there's a, a theater magazine called uh, Theater Journal, uh, and I wrote an article about Tent Rep, and they used this as the cover picture, and you can see why. <laughs> and, okay, again, now they're setting up the tent. These are the slout players. Go ahead. And there's the slout show. Bill Slout just died recently. He was in his 90s. He was the nicest combination of being a tent rep player. His father ran a tent rep company in Michigan, and he was also an academic. He had a PhD from UCLA, won a wonderful book on tent theater, uh, was the mentor to all of us who went down to this theater museum. He was a, just a terrific man. And there's the show news, a little magazine next. And up in the left-hand corner, as you look, it says Bill Slout, and that's what he looked like in his younger days. Go ahead. And there he is in the middle. And that, ladies and gentlemen, as they say, opera houses, air domes, tent wrap, circle stop. Gone but not forgotten. I know about them. And now you know about them, too. Thank you very much. We would not have been able to do this without Humanities Iowa. Um, they gave us the money to send Richard to us and other, other great speakers that we've had. And um, we learn a lot about the different histories that you probably wouldn't know about previously. So we have to thank Humanities Iowa for, for giving us the money and giving us people like Richard.